from where does authority come? What gives a person authority? I'm sure you should probably ask you, you know, the question, you know, by whose authority do you do that, you know? Well, you have to start tracing it back in a very long line. Ultimately, to the source of the law itself. That's a very, very long line. You know, we can look up at the top of our high altar and we can see Moses with the Ten Commandments. And there was the covenant established with God and Israel, inscribed in stone tablets. But you know, that's not the original law. Because instinctively, we all know right from wrong, the good from the bad, the beautiful from the ugly. It's inscribed on our hearts, and what the church teaches us is called the natural law. But again, from where does this come? And the answer is, authority comes from God. It begins there. He is the source of everything. It's a shame, though, that in houses of justice, the the recognition of that truth is being taken down. So no longer are Ten Commandments being displayed in houses of justice, lest we offend anybody without faith. That's a different homily. So, and I, I, was an, I was an Army officer for 13 years, and so I went through our Army ROTC at the University of Toledo, and of course there's, all, there's leadership classes everywhere. I mean, no matter what line of work you get into, you're going to have a leadership class somewhere. Leadership 101. Can authority be delegated? And the answer, of course, is yes. You can delegate authority. I give you responsibility. You know, take you know, take charge of ten tribes and go out and, and or, or what you know. As we see this all throughout Scripture, where authority is given, you know, to the judges, to you know, to the authority over the twelve tribes of Israel, and so on and so forth. So, uh, authority can be delegated. Here's the second part of the question. Can responsibility be delegated? And the answer is no. We are all responsible for our actions and the consequences of our actions. You know? One of my favorite science fiction programs, of course, is, you know, Star Trek. You know, I grew up on the original series, and, you know, Captain Kirk is saying, I am responsible for the actions of my crew. Yeah, that's, that's leadership 101. You are responsible for your actions and responsibility can never be delegated. And we are also responsible for the authority wielded in our name. You know, again, going back to the, you know, to the, you know, the Enterprise Star Trek example, you know, you know, Captain Kirk gives, you know, you know, tells Scotty to do something. Scotty screws up something and causes damage to the entire ship. You know, who is responsible? Well, it's, it's the captain's fault. Remember, all of us will stand before Christ for our particular judgment, to give an account of what has been entrusted to us. And there are many parables in the gospel about that. You know, the most obvious one is the parable of the talents. It gives one person ten, five, and one, you know, the one with ten makes another ten, the one with five makes another five, but the one with one buries it in the ground and comes back, you know, here, you know. What? You couldn't even put it in the bank and get some interest back on that? Away with you, wicked servants. Here's another one. To those who have more, more will be required. So we all come from different stages and walks and social statuses in life, depending upon economic situations and opportunities and everything else. But if you've got more, guess what? 
more will be required of you because you have been given additional responsibilities. And by the way, with those with more, there will be a greater accounting. So it is vital for us to be faithful stewards of the many gifts that have been given to us. And, of course, and they have to be used according to God's plan and not ours. There's the key. Remember, we build the kingdom of God first to fulfill our kingly office. And in the meantime, you still have, you have the responsibility of paying your taxes, raising your children, doing all those other things you need to do in this life. All right, test time, and all the sisters are watching to see if you paid attention in school. What are the four marks of the church? Four marks of the church. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Take note, sister, because they've they got to come back to remedial training. We pray this every single time we pray the, the, uh, the Nicene Creed. One, holy, Catholic, and apostolic, right? We are one church, we are one we are one holy, Catholic, and apostolic. I want to look at the fourth one, the fourth mark of the church. We are an apostolic church. Jesus established a church, and he established a hierarchy. You know, those 12 guys up there? The apostles. He gave them authority to teach in his name. We are an apostolic church, and through the succession of the apostles to this very day, through the laying on of hands, the apostolic tradition continues. The apostles and their successors, the bishops, in communion with the successor of St. Peter, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, who is currently Pope Francis hands on and teaches the apostolic faith to us so that we may share eternal life and glory with God. That's an awesome responsibility. So for the guy that wears the funny hats, guess what? Even more of him will be required because he has the authority to teach in Jesus' name. And by faith, we are bound to submit to the teachings of the church. Our salvation depends upon it. Any authority that teaches counter to the teachings of the church, to the teachings of Christ, can lead us away from him and to our own damnation. We are living in very interesting times, and there are many prevalent moral evil, evils in our society, and we even have laws in our own country that protect them. We are bound by the law of God first. Talking about the evil of abortion, because life begins at the moment of conception and ends in a natural death at the time that God chooses, not us. We have two feast days in the church that celebrate the sanctity of life that begins at conception, the Immaculate Conception and the Annunciation. Life is precious, life is holy, and it begins at that time. But unfortunately, in our society, it has become prevalent and is imbued in our very existence, unfortunately. We cannot escape the effects of moral evil and moral actions in our lives. And the church does teach us that we are to avoid any interaction with moral evil to the best of our abilities. And in some cases, we can be immediately responsible or we can be a remote participant. Example, you pay taxes to the government. The government says there is a law that protects a woman's right to choose to abort her baby. Are you complicit? 
well, we can have a nice theological and philosophical dis discussion, you know, down the pub over a pint, you know, and it could go last into the evening. The bottom line, yes, it's a moral evil, and if you want to qualify where that fits into moral obligations, there is a remote connection, however very, very remote. In this time of global pandemic, we need to fight the effects of COVID-19 as a first-hand witness of its effects. I see it in the hospital. I cannot go into rooms and lay hands on COVID patients lest I become infected and spread that out, out elsewhere. Even the attending doctors cannot go into the rooms. Only the attending nurse goes in there, does whatever she needs to do, reports back to the doctor. The doctor tells her, you know, tells the nurse what to do, and that's how the patient is cared for. It's very, very sad. In a moment of, you know, a moment of suffering, there's no one there to hold that person's hand. However, through the use of modern medical sciences, there have become, there are vaccines, and we all know the issue of the use of vaccines because back in the '60s, there were some abortions and stem cell were developed from those abortions, and that stem cell line is continue in use to this day because of its pharmaceutical capabilities. Please bear with me as I read to you a letter from the U.S. Catholic Conference of Bishops regarding the use of vaccines in this time of pandemic. As Pope St. John II never tired of claiming to the world, the Church has always taught and continues to teach that the result of human procreation from the first moments of its existence must be guaranteed that unconditional respect which is morally due to the human being in his or her totality and unity as body and spirits recognizing that respect due to each member of the human race, the Church does not now or has ever accepted abortion. Christian tradition is clear and unanimous from the beginning up to our own day in describing abortion as a particularly grave moral disorder. It is because of this respect for the human person that the USCCB, in collaboration with other organizations working to protect human life, have engaged in a campaign advocating for the development of a vaccine for COVID-19 that has no link to abortion. But pharmaceutical companies have been working on a vaccine for COVID-19 without using morally compromised cell lines at all. Others have been using such cell lines in either the design or the development phase, or the production phase, or in both. Still, others have been making use of a morally compromised cell line for only for a confirmatory test of the vaccine's efficacy. This leads many people who are concerned with the sanctity of human life to ask if it is ethical to accept any of the vaccines that have some connection to abortion. The Holy See, through the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and the Pontifical Academy for Life, have offered guidance on the question of whether it is morally acceptable to receive a vaccine that has been created with the use of morally compromised cell lines. Both the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith and the Pontifical Academy for Life emphasizes the positive moral obligation to do good and in doing so, distance oneself as much as possible from the immoral act of another party, such as abortion, in order to avoid cooperation with someone else's evil actions to avoid giving scandal, which could happen if one's own actions were perceived by other people to ignore or to minimize the evil action. Our love of neighbor 
should lead us to avoid scandal, but we cannot omit fulfilling serious obligations such as the prevention of a deadly infection and the spread of a contagion among those who are vulnerable just to avoid the appearance of scandal. The Holy See points out there are different degrees of responsibility in cooperating with the evil actions of others. With regard to people involved in the development and production of vaccines, the Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith explains that in organizations where cell lines of illicit origin are being utilized, the responsibility of those who make the decisions to use them is not the same of those who have no choice in such a decision. As for the moral responsibility of those who are merely the recipients of the vaccines, the Congregation affirms that a serious health danger could justify the use of a vaccine which was developed using cell lines of illicit origin while keeping in mind that everyone has a duty to make their own disagreement and to ask that their health care system make use of vaccines available. It's important to note that the, use, that the making of the rubella vaccine or that of the new COVID-19 vaccines do not involve cell lines taken directly from the body of an aborted baby. Cells taken from two abortions in the 1960s were replicated in a laboratory to produce two cell lines that continue to be reproduced again and again indefinitely. To make the rubella vaccine, cells from these cell lines were stimulated to produce chemicals necessary for the vaccine. It is not as if making of the vaccine required ever more cells for even more abortions. The current COVID-19 pandemic has created a situation with circumstances similar to those posed by rubella. First, at least at present, there is no available alternative vaccine that has absolutely no connection to abortion. Second, the risk to public health is very serious, as evidenced by the millions of affections worldwide and hundreds of thousands of deaths in the United States of America alone. Third, in many cases, the most important effect of vaccination may not be the protection it offers the person who receives the vaccine, who may be of relatively robust health and unlikely to be seriously affected by the disease. Rather, the more important effect may be for the protection it offers to those who are much more likely to be seriously stricken by the disease if they are to contract it through exposure to those infected. There are currently two vaccines that have been presented to us as have demonstrated their effectiveness and are likely to be made available in the coming months. This is written a few months ago, but that would be Pfizer and Moderna. Neither Pfizer nor Moderna vaccines used morally compromised cell lines in the design, development, or production of the vaccine. A confirmatory test, however, employing the commonly used but morally compromised cell line was performed on both vaccines. Thus, neither vaccine is completely free from any connection to morally compromised cell lines. In this case, the connection is very remote from the initial evil of abortion. In view of the gravity of the current pandemic and the lack of available alternative vaccines, the reason to accept the new COVID-19 vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna are sufficiently serious to justify their use, despite the remote connection to morally compromised cell lines. In addition, the COVID-19 vaccine ought to be understood as an act of charity toward the members of our community. In this way, being vaccinated safely against COVID-19 should be considered an act of love of our neighbor and part of our moral responsibility for the common good. I apologize for that lengthy, uh, lengthy you know, letter, and that was just actually an exhortation or many other clinical um, um, and chemical type descriptions of what is happening here. Bottom line, the two vaccines that are available right now are Pfizer and Moderna that have some connection to abortion. The use of those vaccines by any person places you in a remote, distant proximity to the evil action. The benefit is that there is a greater benefit for the common good of the people around us. Now, the reason 
I wanted to bring this teaching to the church to you is that right now, these are the two vaccines that are currently available. And as we've all been watching the news, it's being rolled out in phases. And by the time it gets to the general population, which may be in the summer or later of this year, other manufacturers will have vaccines on the market which are directly using aborted stem cell lines. The next one on the starting blocks is from Johnson & Johnson, which says, you know, it's only a one, literally a one-shot deal, so you don't have to go back and get another one. So if you had a choice between Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, and Moderna, you are morally obligated to receive Pfizer or Moderna. But what about stem cell, or what about vaccines that have no connection to abortion? There is one pharmaceutical, one small pharmaceutical company in Europe that are currently, is currently under development. The likelihood of that vaccine reaching the United States is remote because their first priority is going to be, of course, to their people there. You will not incur any type of moral judgment against using a compromised cell line. However, it's to your own conscience on what you want to choose to do. There are many things to consider, the common good of the community, the support of an evil action, and your own health. More, if you go to the USCCB website, this letter is available on their website. You can read it in full. But if you have any other questions, because I'm starting to get these questions in my capacity as the chaplain in the hospital. I myself have received both vaccinations because I'm exposed to COVID on a daily basis, interaction with other people in the hospital, interaction with patients. And I get tested twice a week. The, you know, the, the, the threat is very, very real. This is very, very serious. We have a tendency to be, if we're remote from it and have not, have not any ex uh, contact with it, we just think it's happening to other people. I can tell you it's very, very real, and the, and the wards are very, very full of people who are very, very alone because no one can come near them except their primary care provider. Jesus is the embodiment of the authority of God here on earth, and he gives that authority to those who teach in his name. Those who teach in his name want the same thing that Christ wants for us, to love one another, to be with them forever in heaven.